Okay, so before I move on to the question, I actually want to give the floor to you to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about the about your work, but at the intersection of AI, open source, and responsible adoption of best practices. So I'll begin with you, Benjia. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Unja Tang, and I'm the head of data at Digiho. So Digiho is a startup, uh, but it's a captive startup of DHL. So um, I have been leading the data team for about two and a half years. So it's, the company is three years old. So I joined when it was still half a year old. And I led the data team starting from two person to currently we have seven people um, in the data team. It's a still very small team, but um, no, it's um, something that we want to grow and develop in the future as well. Um, so we, as a company, we are the um, road haulage company. So we are the biggest subcontractor service provider for DHL Supply Chain UK. And what we are doing is trying to make sure that all your deliveries <laughs> are <laughs> arriving on time and hopefully on budget. Um, and the mission of the company, although you know that is our basic um, fundamental mission, but the um, a bit more long-term vision for the company is to decarbonize the UK road network. Um, so that with the power of data and the power of AI, we hope that we can achieve that with all the collaboration that we can have here. All right. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone, and, and thanks to the Alan Turing Institute for inviting me to join you here today. Uh, so my name's Chris Easton. I'm a partner at uh, Field Fisher. Uh, I was originally a physicist, uh, but many, many years ago, I uh, became a lawyer. Uh, I hope you won't hold that against me. Um, but I've been a, a partner at Field Fisher. Um, I've been at Field Fisher for, for, for over a decade now, um, joining the partnership within the last few years. And I've over that time, um, my role has been advising clients from the biggest enterprises um, down to the uh, you know founders and some of the uh, small really innovative uh, companies in the in the tech sector fast growth companies and advising them on technology issues so whilst my bread and butter has been uh, you know IT transactions tech transactions outsourcing outsourcing commercial arrangements more recently with the um, advent of AI and my uh, interest from my, my my physics background in emerging technologies. Um, I now lead our emerging technologies practice. So I've been advising clients increasingly on uh, implementing and de-risking AI and adopting responsible AI within their organizations. Hi, I'm Sam Young. So I lead the AI and data science team at Energy Systems Catapult. Um, so we are an organization that exists to accelerate innovation to net zero. Um, and so my role in that, when I kind of got the job, the hiring manager said, if you could just look at everything happening in the AI space and everything happening in the energy sector and work out what energy needs from AI and make that happen, that'd be great. So nice, small uh, role. Um, I've been at the Catapult for a couple of years now, um, working on open data, um, embedding kind of best practice, helping people find um, use cases that they can apply AI to. And before that, I was at National Grid and then financial services uh, prior to that. So I'm going to try to be the voice of small companies here um, and try to provoke you a little bit. Um, so. Great, open science, open source sound amazing, but what does it mean to me? So can you help me understand what open practices means for a company? And for this, I will start with you, Chris. Sure, okay, I guess, um, so the, where, where I get involved in open source, I probably should have said actually what, what my connection with open source is. So whilst my day job is a, a partner at Field Fisher advising on technology law, um, I also do some pro bono work um, which I don't get paid for, it's entirely voluntary. And I do that with Open UK. And actually, I was hoping Amanda might be here this morning. She's the, the CEO of Open UK, which is effectively, it's a not-for-profit and it's the, the organization for promoting the use of open technologies and openness um, within the UK. Um, I'm the chief legal officer there uh, on a voluntary basis. And, and what we try and do is we try and work with um, government in particular to make sure that they understand the issues that are facing 
um, open communities and making sure that enterprise and, uh, are able to adopt, uh, as well as uh, public sector and enterprise, are able to adopt open practices and open source technology just as easily as, if, as they can proprietary technology, um, because I believe in the positive uh, impact that open can make and I want you know governments and I want enterprises to be able to, to, to make the most out of that. Um, so what, what we're doing there essentially is we're looking at the challenges that are being raised by AI in particular, uh, so particularly uh, in relation to the processing of personal data, in relation to infringement of IP rights, uh, and in relation to um, how do you adopt models for licensing of the new technology, which doesn't necessarily fit exactly into the existing uh, models that we have for licensing software and data, and make sure that uh, there are ways of doing that effectively so that it can be adopted by as many people as possible. Now, of course, open technology is a great boon for SMEs because it reduces the barrier to entry uh, in some of these uh, more complicated areas. You know, they don't have millions of pounds to spend in R&D in developing new software. So actually, if you can go to an open repository, you know, find a project that um, is working towards you know, what you want to achieve, you can take that and you can use it as a, a building block, standing on the shoulders of giants, as it were, to be able to accelerate your adoption. And when it comes to the AI space and the difficulty um, that you would have in developing and training your own models without access to broad data sets, open data sets, actually having openness and a culture of openness in that part of the economy is really important um, to generate innovation within the UK. Does that kind of answer your question? Definitely. And that brings me very nicely to you, Benji, uh, as a small company and in a very fast-paced company where data is everywhere. Um, and there is also you know, competitive edge into how different companies are trying to give better services to their customer. What does openness would mean for DigiHall, for instance? Well, wow, that's the whole reason I'm here. <laughs> All right. So I think as an um, um, SME company, like you just called, as uh, Chris just highlighted, that we probably don't have millions of dollars or pounds or euros to invest in R&D. But what we want to do is really kind of standing on the shoulder of the giants, as you just uh, alluded to, to make sure that, you know, we understand the current trend, we understand the current standard of um, way of working, and we understand we can actually leverage what is already being developed that with all the consideration of privacy and IP and, you know, the um, kind of uh, compliance. Um, so what it means in particular for us is actually accelerates our pace to uh, for rotation with our ideas. Because I was talking to um, one of you earlier that, you know, as a small company, we have loads of ideas and use cases that would actually help us achieve what we want to achieve. Um, but what we are lacking is the resources. And we apparently we couldn't invest in people invest in technology in a very short time frame as many other maybe bigger company or enterprise can do. But what we can really look into is a two-way system with open open data, with open methodologies, so that we can uh, look into what we have already, what has already been developed, and we can actively contribute to those projects. And so that is a kind of community evolving process so that we can take part, um, we can participate in. Yeah, um, okay. thank you. So you kind of are saying that it's not only about the competition with different companies, it's about actually working with them as a community. So Sam, now that you work with different SMEs in helping them adopt open source, open practices, open data, how do you define open for them? How do you bring, on, bring them on board and get buy-in in you know, utilizing these practices? So I think it's often quite easy for SMEs to see, oh, someone else has done something, I want to reuse that. Um, there's kind of like, oh, sure, I'll take, why should I give? It's pretty obvious. Um, what we see in the energy sector quite a bit is um, there's often, whilst there's competition, there's also a shared goal of getting to net zero quickly. Um, and so there are areas where there's a, a collaboration of, well, we can see that this has value for 
the whole sector, the whole of society. Um, and so there are, are opportunities where there, there is work that can be shared or um, often even it's the, the kind of thinking about, is this just a component that someone else could reuse? So a really great example for me is um, with open data in the energy sector, we've made big progress on that. But if you want to um, look at which power plants exist and you want to gather information about power plants in the UK, you have to join together about seven different data sets. And each of those data sets has a different naming convention and different IDs. And so everyone in the sector who has a need to do that has been recreating the same fuzzy mapping between IDs of all of these data sets. And that's not really a source of competitive advantage. It's like, oh, I've managed to like match that string to that string. Like, that's not really where you want to be spending your time, where you think there's competitive advantage. And so there's a, an open source project called Power Station Dictionary, where people have collaborated to do that once centrally, and then everyone else can reuse that mapping to build the things that really are kind of their competitive advantage. So that's where I think it's the kind of looking for the things that join up key bits of infrastructure, kind of enable people to build their businesses. Those are the things that we can kind of collaborate on quite effectively. Okay, so now I'm going back to the voice of SMEs. Great, I like what you're talking about, open source, open data, open practices, they sound amazing. Um, but now, how can I go from just understanding the concept to implementing it for my particular company, which may not have as much resource as other companies do? Um, yeah, would, would wonder, Sam, do you want to respond to that first? Sure, um, I guess, we have this same challenge with us as a team, right? We're not a huge team. Um, and so there's always the question of, well, it does take that incremental extra effort to make something open to kind of collaborate with the community. Um, the, the how do you justify it? Um, and how do you kind of like actually start doing it? I think for me, it's um, by trying to think what is actually genuinely useful to the community. So. Um, there's a little bit of value to getting into the practice of open and like putting something random openly out somewhere, but there's much more value to going, oh, you know what, there's this small thing that that would be really useful. Um, and so I think there, there's that element of kind of like, just find a small manageable, like the power station dictionary is a good example. You were going to have to do it anyway. Like you could probably do a better job of keeping it up to date if other people were helping you keep it up to date. So kind of make that open source. Um, the other thing that I would say, um, really kind of like thinking from a, an SME perspective, is being really clear about where, where is your competitive advantage and what are you building your competitive advantage on. Um, and sometimes open, you might feel like it would undermine your competitive advantage, but sometimes it can actually accelerate and enable that advantage. Um, so uh, I'll tell you a horror story. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was a, an organization in the energy sector called Verifirm, and their, um, the product that they had developed was a heat loss calculation algorithm and kind of technique for you go into a home, you leave this running overnight, and then you can tell how much heat is being lost from the building. Um, and that kind of massively accelerates the process of measuring building performance. Um, great algorithm. They'd been kind of running with it for four or five years. Um, and then they, and they had a, a patent for their technology. Um, a couple of weeks ago, a large multinational corporation um, threatened to sue them for patent infringement if they didn't cease trading. Um, and they couldn't cover, they looked at what would the legal costs be, and they couldn't kind of cover that legal bill to fight it. And so made the decision, okay, we're going to kind of step out of this business. So there you go, like, well, that's what IP law is meant to protect and so on. But contrast that with, in the US, um, a, a different organization um, called Recurve. They were trying to do something similar around measuring energy savings. Um, and what they did was they worked with the energy networks and financial services companies to produce... Um, a standardized an open source methodology and the open source implementation of that in code 
um, and they kind of handed that over to the Linux Energy Foundation. They kind of have put loads of time and energy and effort into building that up. As a result, it's become really widely adopted. They are now they have their kind of software as a service platform that sits on top of that. They're now part of like tens, hundreds of millions of customer um, energy efficiency um, installations in the US. So there they were like, well, we could try and make the algorithm for this energy savings our competitive advantage, but the challenge really is wide scale adoption. And actually, if we make it open source and standardize, we can accelerate with that wide scale adoption. We can have transparency and trust. And then we can work out, well, what, where are the other bits where we can get our competitive advantage? So that would be my thought is like, don't assume, oh, we'll be giving away competitive advantage, but think about, well, sometimes open can, um, if you pick the right thing, you can make it kind of a source of your market, a source of your kind of opportunity. So based on your legal experience, Chris, can you talk to folks which may have similar fear and doubts about openness? Yeah, sure. So. <clears throat> First, you mentioned fear, fear and doubt. Um, Amanda, who, who isn't with us yet, um, has a great phrase, which is FUD. And she talks about FUD in the um, in the open source sector: fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And uh, and what she's referring to there is um, the fact that an open label could be quite a positive thing when you're you know working with when you're looking for customers and you're trying to build a community. And there are some. Um, I won't name any names, but there are some businesses out there that use the term a little bit loosely, and actually they call something open, but in reality it doesn't satisfy the sort of definition that we would uh, look at for, for open source, which is around, um, uh, if, you, if you look at the open source initiative, for example, you've got the open source definition, there are 10 freedoms that any open source license uh, would have to comply with in order for it to be an open source license, including... Um, you know, no restriction on field of endeavor, for example. So you can't say, oh, well, this is for non-commercial use only. Um, that, that wouldn't be an open source um, license. You, you talked about um, the importance of community. And actually, you know, when you look at the, 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 the business models that are being used out there in the open source environment, and I want to be clear that open source is not itself a business model, um, but you can obviously use open source to uh, and leverage the value in that in order to um, assist your business model. Um, when, when you look at the um, business models out there, a lot of them rely on the fact that you have this community, um, either because it's your customer base um, or because they're your workforce in that um, you know, you're relying on the fact that it's developed in the open to get people to look at it. Many eyes um, will we'll spot the bugs, right? So they'll you get better, you get stable software without having to put all that investment into it. Um, but certainly, you know, working in the open source community as a business, a uh, profit making business, you don't have to fear it. I think you you need to understand how to operate, but it shouldn't be a source of fear for you because there are there are lots of businesses out there that have business models that are very successful. You know, if you look at uh, Red Hat, if you look at Canonical, uh, if you look at you know the, some of the other open source businesses out there, um, you know big names like Amazon, for example, use a huge amount of open source. In fact, the, the vast majority of software includes open source to some extent. Um, so whether you're uh, you have a sort of open core model where the, the the core product is open source, but you provide functionality that sits around it, which is proprietary. Whether you're providing services and consulting in relation to uh, open source, uh, you know, or one of the other, um, it's a bit of a holy grail finding business models that work with open source, but there's probably, I think, five or six models that are sort of tried and tested and, and you see, you know, very successful companies. Uh, and actually, until quite recently, some of the biggest software transactions out there, some of the, you know, were in relation to open source uh, businesses. So it's certainly not, you know, working with open is not going to put a limit on your business. It's not going to, you know, cap your, um, your potential. Uh, actually, if you get the community right and you get the business model right, uh, it can be a real accelerator for growth. Every time uh, someone in open source talks about license, they say, I'm not the lawyer, talk to a lawyer. So we do have a lawyer in the panel. You can always talk to them. Just coming back to you on that same question, Vanjia, what does the tangible implementation of open mean to you or your company? Right, so I think there are 
a, quite a lot of different layers if we want to tear them up and then examine them one by one. So I think the top one, which for me is the most important one as well, is the leadership adoption. So we have to get this top-down buy-in from C-suites. At least we have to convince them that, you know, open source is not like you, like you just said, like, you know, create, creating a fear of uncertainty. It's more encouraging the collaborative culture, uh, encouraging the sharing, you know, kind of eco ecosystem across the company or even with the external community and organization. Um, and then the second bit is we have to, to make it practical. We have to bring structure. So as a company, you always want to look at ROI. And we have to bring the structure and the strategic and the systematic uh, implementation plan for that. So we have to assess and you know looking into our current existing product, existing workflow to say, okay, where are the areas that we can identify to bring the best benefit of open source? And have a tangible plan to um, pan out the roadmap and implement accordingly. Um, and alongside this, we will need to involve this, you know, like uh, lawyer or the legal um, team just to make sure that there's no um, IP challenge, there's no um, compliance issue. And we also need to look into the privacy challenges that, you know, make sure that along the way, there's no loophole that we, we accidentally fall into. Um, and also from IT perspective, we also need to look at the vulnerability because not every open source would always take security as their top priority. So we always need to be very careful with that. Um, and then the next one is for the company level, we have to look at upscaling and educating our own people employee to have this open policy, um, for have encourage open discussion with them to say what it means by open source, how would we embrace this open source policy and make sure that, you know, we encourage people to have this two-way system, like I just said, it's not only taking, but also we are giving, we actively participate in those community events, participate in those open source projects so that, you know, some of the domain knowledge from the company, especially for those people who have been working in this industry sector for, for their lifetime even, they would be able to share their learning back and contribute back to the um, open source community. So that that for me is really kind of different layers than the coming together, mixing up and make sure that all uh, come in play with some, you know, um, coordination. So it's not only one point that we, we would like to emphasize, but the multiple ones. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned, um... I have to. I had to jump in because uh, you mentioned the the the, the use of lawyers and, and getting a legal team involved, and um, you know, in order to make sure that you're resolving this sort of compliance, regulatory compliance, data privacy, IP, you know, uh, commercial contracting type issues. Um, and what I would say is, we we, we come across this all the time. We, we sort of get questions. Well, when when should I reach out to the lawyers, or when should I get the legal team? Um, involved and i would advocate i mean of course i would but I, I would advocate for getting the lawyers in as early as possible because it is much easier and also cheaper to get the lawyers in early work out what you need to do from a compliance perspective and a structuring perspective early on get that early input build it and then it's all good rather than building it then getting the lawyers to look at it realizing you've got to make all sorts of changes and actually having to go back and rebuild the thing um, so definitely get your get your legal teams involved earlier rather than later so in my preparation calls with you what i was very excited by and i i hope you can touch on that a bit um the, the degrees of openness a level of openness that openness does not just mean one thing or it's often not just about the code um i wonder if you could we touch on that from your own particular perspective you know what what could be some of the areas for smes to get started with um maybe you want to go first i'm happy to to kick off with that um i think an area that we often don't talk about is um openness of challenges and openness of problems right so 
uh, we often talk about, well, I'm going to be open with my methodology or open with my data or open with my code. But actually something that's really valuable for the ecosystem is openness of where you are struggling, what, what you would want solved if someone could solve it. Because often that's what you find in the community is there are people who are like, I wish I knew the detail about this sector and could solve problems, but I just don't know the right people and I just don't know the detail. Um, and so that would be my kind of encouragement is to, to get involved in sharing your own um, kind of like, oh, if only we had a solution to this um, and kind of facilitating discussions. There's a big part of we're working with um, the Allen Tree Institute on a program called um, Advice AI for Decarbonization Virtual Center of Excellence, bit of a mouthful. But a big thing that we're doing there is like bringing the challenges to people so they can see them. Um, and I, so I think that's quite key um, is thinking about the, well, what are the, the kind of, what are the challenges that we're facing? Um, I'd tie that to kind of openness about methodology and results and performance. Obviously, some things are commercially sensitive, but also um, you're, we see lots of innovators who they come to us and the thing they're really struggling for is we need evidence that our products work so that investors will invest in them. Um, and that challenge of, well, how do you build that body of evidence? Um, and if there's a it, if there's a kind of like wider understanding, of, well, these are good ways to develop those bodies of evidence, and here's similar products and how well they perform, and kind of like the the ramp for everyone, and kind of like the speed with which pe people can demonstrate that their solution works um, improves. So that's the kind of uh, yeah methodology for demonstrating the value. Um, I think is another one that's quite powerful. Yeah, I'd. Um... I'd echo that. I think being open in, in conversation um, with who you're talking to and what you're talking about is really helpful. W one of the things that we're seeing when we're advising enterprise on, in relation to AI risk, one of the first things that tends to happen before you get formal governance structures set up is you get a few people who think, you know what, we really need to be thinking about AI within this business and we really need to be thinking about how we do it in a, in a sensible, responsible, compliant way. And those individuals seek each other out and start a conversation. And you end up with this um, communication layer across the organization, which is cross-functional. Um, so you get people from legal, from data compliance, from regulatory, talking to the tech people, talking to PR, talking to customer uh, facing people, talking to leadership. And that conversation starts and then it tends to go next to, okay, now what do we do about it? Um, but the first thing you have to have is that communication and have a community which is talking about it. Um, open development is all about community. So whether you're having a community internally within your organization, if it's a very large organization, or whether you're going out and involving yourself in a community externally, I think involvement in community must be the first step uh, in, in, in pursuing an, an open agenda. I, I definitely echo what you two just said. I think we need to start from small. <laughs> so essentially there are kind of two ways we can, or two lens we can look at this within the organization and uh, you know, in parallel with other organization, the external ones. So within the organization, apparently, you know, it's very straightforward just to think about, oh, I have new ideas, where do I start with? <laughs> and you can talk to your colleague within the team, cross function, but I think for me, the driving probably should be the educational level across the organization. So it's pretty much like training and upskilling is the first step for me. Because you know, people probably know that, okay, I, I do have loads of questions, but I don't know where to start with, where to start with. They probably need some, need some push or some of the guidance um, from the professional, peop professional people that you know looking after them in terms of data literacy, for example, AI literacy, so that, oh, hang on a minute, this is not crystal ball. This is indeed something that people can help me with. And what I found interesting with the very traditional, you know, for example, uh, Road Haulage, my company is, is quite traditional um, sector, and people could have polarized the view of AI. They either see it as a you know, magician or they, they they're really afraid of it and don't want to get in touch with it at all. So they thought they're going to lose a job because of AI. So 
I think sophistication in the education is the key for me to make sure that they are not paralyzed. They have this, you know, fundamental knowledge and acknowledgement that this is going to help them so that they can be a bit more open gradually, step by step. Um, so for me, that is well, Bridge AI, for example, can come into really helpful. Um, the second one that I just mentioned earlier is the external one. So I think it's pretty much like one organization voice is not enough. We probably need, you, need, you need to have a critical mass to be able to um, form a kind of industry-wide community or no voice so that you can form a standard. Um, and like uh, some just you know, gave the example around this you know, interface, the standard and data convention, NAM convention, that needs multiple companies' efforts. So I would say that that would require the maybe some of the help from the uh, governance body, the you know the um, kind of you know whoever is going to look after the community would be able to help us to have that voice. For example, have the open data sharing. So if you just share your data and all the other people are not, <laughs> I'm not going. I'm not sure it's going to survive long. But you probably have this consensus that data sharing is our top priority, and we need need to work towards that collectively that would help to form that you know open openness across the industry and sectors okay um so i i actually really really resonate with that it, i almost find that like you know quite warm and fuzzy that you're talking about uh, that you know company and making profit does not mean that we need to deviate from what in general society needs we all have to have a standard that we are all complying with we are working in a way that we can uh, you know share knowledge which is where the community part that you both have been talking about and it's very easy if you are actually building an open source model to really tap on each other's shoulder on things like you know i don't have legal team hey can you please provide me service and i would you know obviously offer compensation for that um, because often open source does not mean providing compensation but i think this is where we are also moving when we are working with big companies one of the things I, I wonder, Sam, if you could touch on that, um, which really scared me, where you said that companies should really go out and work with open source communities. Um, and um, the reason why it scared me, because, of course, there are big organizations that do take advantage of open source community without giving back. Um, how do we change that culture? How do we promote small companies to actually work in open, but in an ethical manner? I think um, my comment on this would be that your behaviors tend to reflect your culture as an organization. So it's unlikely that that is the only thing that you're doing that people go, oh, I don't, don't really think that's ethical or happy with. Um, and so my comment would be kind of like, how do you actually change that? Like, think about, well, is openness a value that you want in your organization culture generally what's the value of that in terms of your strategy and direction what impact does that have on your like employees and how they kind of work um so i i think the i wouldn't be like oh open source is the thing you need to think about but sort of what are your what are the things you're trying how are you trying to get your employees to think what are the things you're trying to value how are you trying to kind of like influence um and I think then when you're thinking about small companies and kind of the, the practicalities, um, you don't have to think as a small company, um, and often when you are a small company, you don't have the time and the space to do everything. And so much about what you have to do is to like, how do I narrow it down? How do I focus on what's important? Um, and so my encouragement would be, uh, uh, you come here, you've shown some kind of interest in open source. Don't don't be overwhelmed by the well there's so much that we could do kind of find something that's a good strategic fit think about are there people in your organization who they've been chomping at the bit to do open source so they want to do it um and think about okay well what would it look like for that to add value to our organization and the wider community um, and use that as kind of like the nucleus that you build around um because ultimately it's the um, the kind of longer term value comes from um, employee buy-in, reputation within the kind of sector. You can actually get, you can get a lot of work done 
for free by the open source community if you've got the kind of influence and people respect you and you kind of have a good vision for the direction that things should go you don't have to do all the work yourself but if you kind of come in and just go oh i want this and i want this and i want this and i want this and i want this you're not going to be listened to as much as if you have a track record of well we thought this would be useful so we built it and oh you all found it useful and oh oh there's this big thing that we don't quite have the capability to build shall we build it together um so that'd be kind of my thoughts on kind of direction like start with something very tangible you can see the benefits and and plan a, a wider like how do we really build reputation in this community and what is our kind of long-term game um to kind of benefit the community and benefit from the community anything you both want to add uh, yeah sure so um there's a phrase isn't the rising a rising tide lifts all boats so i think you know if you if you go into a community with the attitude that look i'm going to contribute to this and yes it's going to help others and yes it's going to help me and we're all going to benefit and everything's going to get better that's probably a sensible uh, sensible you know optimistic attitude to, to to go in with in terms of controlling behavior and ensuring ethical behavior uh, and the limited resources of a you know a small enterprise i don't think limited resources is any justification for not behaving ethically or responsibly um you know, if anything, you need to you need to be more so because you need to be projecting that positive impact, uh, that positive Im image. Sorry, um, you know there are a number of drivers, of course, you know, behind this. So one is around the community. So if you go into a community and you don't behave ethically, you won't remain a part of that community for very long because people just won't engage with you if you're, you know, if you're not um, if you're not behaving in the in, in the way that's expected. Um, secondly customers vote with their feet so you know if you're not behaving ethically it's becoming more important to to, to people now i think people are recognizing um that that the businesses need to behave ethically uh, there's a whole movement around it you know and uh, I, I think um it's really high on the agenda of, of most businesses and certainly customers think about it so um you know you need to behave ethically in order to to keep your customers and then thirdly if you behave unethically and that that unethical behavior is unlawful then of course there's the legal challenge and you will be subject to to, to, to legal challenge either from regulators or from uh, your customers or your competitors or your vendors or whoever else you're uh, behaving badly towards um so there's a there's a, a triple threat there so i i think i probably can cover from a bit more kind of execution implementation perspective um so i think the open source project should not be treated as any different as the other normal project in the company for example in the company you normally start with a proof of concept and then you actively monitor that and you report the result and everything is transparent and so that you can um, have the credibility to actually get into your next project so i can't think of reason why you know open source projects should be different um and in fact it's even more important that we have transparency for open source project, not maybe not only internally, but also externally, when you have the communication with the community with the other external organizations, those are the facts and figures that you can present. So, so things are built on your, you know, the you know, credibility. So once you get those attraction from, you know, your colleagues, your peers, your external partners, it's much easier to actually get accelerated. Because you know, in, if you have a proof track record, track record like you just said, then you will be able to have the idea sharing, have the you know collaboration forming much more easily. So I would think this is positive feedback people want to get by behaving ethically, by uh, promoting transparency. And I couldn't think of a reason why people wouldn't do that. Yes. I, I, in the break, I'll put this XKCD cartoon. If you've not seen how open source infrastructure works, I, I suppose a lot of people in here know, but that's exactly the reality that all, so, uh, all open source are built on open, uh, sorry, all software are built on open source. And one of the statements from Felix Reda that I remember is that if you want to understand open source, go back and check out what you are using because every single person in the world uses open source. Um, I will be asking last question, and that's a that's kind of a reminder for you. If you want to ask questions for our speakers, people in person can raise their hand. And um, Ali has been sharing the Slido for folks online. 
um, folks online, you're also very welcome to raise your hand and we'll, we'll probably pass the mic for you. My final question before we move to the audience question is very much in the direction that where the conversation is going, that a lot of conversation we're having for smaller companies, it's not the first time that conversation is ever happening. There are companies that have done it. There are people who've solved the problem. So knowing that any problem that a company will face has been solved somewhere else. How can smaller company learn from established bigger companies? Um, especially, you know, just sticking to the topic of uh, adopting open practices in AI. So I wonder, Manjia, you want to start with this? So I think that's also a very, very interesting question. So essentially, you, we need to know what lessons learned for the big company, and that is community community building in the first place. So if um, we have this community built across different types of organization, different sources of, you know, contributors. And, you know, those lessons learned will evolve, you know, quite naturally. Um, so that's one source. And then the other source is probably with the educational opportunities that we have with the governing, governing, you know, with the governing bodies, that we could have a standard way of learning and to have the you know understand the industry trend that's actually actively contributed by the you know early adopters in the sector that is actually very useful and helpful for the small companies like us yeah i guess it's more um more probably possibly more a question for the other panelists than for for, for me but what i would observe is that um and, and the obvious answer, of course, is get involved in the open source community so that you have visibility of what, what others are doing and how they're solving problems. But I would observe that, you know, where you've got small and medium enterprises coming into the open source community, um, you, you know, you shouldn't be surprised to also see the tech giants in there. You know, so Microsoft, IBM, Amazon, et cetera, you know, Meta, they're, they're all in there. They're all doing open source um, work. And they are trying to solve some of the, 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 the problems that are emerging in this space as well so th there was a recent um uk ico consultation that's come out around the processing of personal data for training large language models and you will find those organizations responding to that consultation and getting involved in discussion with with government and lobbying and, and all the rest of it similarly in relation to the challenges around the subsistence of intellectual property rights in the outputs of large language models um, the intellectual property office was work, had a working group trying to put together a code of conduct um, in order to to work out how licensing could operate and how we could how we could solve that problem now it, it didn't quite um, work out. I don't think they're entirely successful in resolving a, resolving the issue because there are um, some very um, strong tensions between the creative and the media sector and the technology sector. Um, but certainly, you know, all, all the big, um, you know, big tech giants were involved in that conversation and trying to drive that conversation forwards with the government, with the IPO, etc. So not only is it a case of, you know, identifying, okay, I've got a problem, who can I look to that might have solved that problem already? but getting yourself involved and seeing what's going on at the very leading edge and anticipating the things that might be coming down the road and contributing your voice and your perspective, because it may very well be that you have the solution um, to a problem that, that, that one of those you know, big enterprises has. Uh, and then of course, there's, a, there's, there's quid pro quo involved and, uh, and you can make yourself useful to them. I guess I'd make three different comments on this. So one is, um, when you think about large tech companies as the success, you know, well, maybe I'll use the same approaches and the same tools, um, but the problems that they have are at a very different scale. Um, and, you know, sometimes you may end up going, oh, well, I'll pick the same tool that like Airbnb use, that must be a good tool, right? But if your business is tiny and their business is huge, you may be like picking a tool that is really complicated and requires a team of 10 engineers to support that tool and so on. So don't assume that like they, they will use great tools, but don't necessarily assume that you need all of the functionality and complexity of the tools that they use. Um, so that'd be my first thing. Like sometimes like find a simpler, easier to use tool. Um, the second thing that I'd say would be, um, it comes back to my like talking about your challenges and problems and how you've solved things. Um, when trying to embed within a community, one of the easiest way to find people who have something useful to share with you is to talk about what you're doing. So if you, I 
if you go to conferences or events, if you are just a passive participant wandering around in a workshop with Alan Turing Institute, um, you might have a chance of bumping into someone who has something useful. But if you're talking, hey, I'm working on this and this is what we did and this is what the challenges we faced are, well, you get people come up to you afterwards and they say, I'm working on something similar. I had this, I had that. So there is this kind of virtuous cycle of talking about what you're doing leads to people talking to you about what they're doing and where it's relevant. And the third thing that I would say um, is a little bit of a, a plug, but um, going to communities that are explicitly for people to talk about how they're doing things. So we are, um, as part of advice, we're running data science sharing circles where we are trying to pair up, well, not pair up, like group up kind of groups of eight of one or two academia or public sector data scientists, a couple of large company data scientists, a couple of SME data scientists. Um, so that then, and then we talk about, so what projects are you working on and what tools do you use and what data do you wish was available? Oh, I know that there's like a data on EV usage over here. Um, and just having that kind of like working level interaction with organizations that are very different from you will often kind of help you find things that you wouldn't necessarily find if you say, oh, I'm just going to subscribe to a few newsletters or that kind of thing. So that would be my suggestion. And the advice data science sharing sessions are one way to do that. That's how I met Benchia. We just bumped into each other at the Bridge AI launch and she dropped me an email and now she's here and we've learned so much from her and yeah it's been fantastic um so definitely we, some of the projects that a lot of a lot of you work on you have actually added the link very kindly in the document and those are some starting places and of course the Turing way so i'm gonna come to ale and um share some the some of the slider questions i'll bring bring this to you first do we have any questions in the room do we just take one one from Slido. So we our online folks, we actually, you know, what is the main barrier to incorporate open practices in your sectors? So your sectors, I would say then transportation, energy, and Chris, you're sector agnostic. What is the biggest barrier? I'm happy to start with energy. Um, I think the the biggest barrier historically, and it's starting to change, um, has been around open data with the, but there might be some value here for me. There might be some commercial value here. I don't know what value there is. Why should I publish the data if it, there might be value for me? It's been years, never got around to actually finding the value. But, um, and so that kind of like the conservatism of, well, maybe there's something here that I would want to protect. Um, is kind of a mindset that you find in some sectors. I think energy is quite a good one, often where you've got like large organizations. So I think that's kind of like a, a barrier in energy, along with potentially there's a little bit of um, like national security, cybersecurity type implications, um, but those are much smaller than they appear when you first look at them. I'm happy to talk about the legal sector actually, because um, you know, to what extent is 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 openness um, present in the legal sector? And I'd say we're pretty poor at it, actually, as a as, as a sector. Some of us are excellent, of course, but but on the whole, we're we're pretty poor. And I think that's because of a lack of understanding. Because when you look at um, legal practitioners who are involved in the open source community and do understand open source issues, you'll find that often they are publishing um, open source materials and they are they are sharing things. Um, there is a there is a, a project. Um, to have a, an, a, an open non-disclosure agreement because a lot of time is wasted. You, you know, I mean, negotiating a non-disclosure agreement, why would you ever, it's, a, you know, it's just something you have to do. Um, so, so actually having, you know, one of these, which is kind of just acceptable to everyone in the market, that would be, that would be a great thing. So there's a project going on for that. Um, there's a project going on to share um, knowledge in the um, ESG space. So contractual clauses that assist with, um, environmental issues, for example. You know, if you want to um, put an obligation on your supplier to have certain um, environmental credentials or do certain things, actually there's a set of clauses that have been developed by a group of lawyers from different law firms and companies all working together. And actually there is, actually the more I think about it, there is quite a bit that goes on because th there are, um, you know, organizations such as the Society of Computers and Law, 
for example, um, which holds regular talks and, and gets presenters from in-house and from private practice firms talking about the issues, you know, in, in, in technology. And actually that's raising the game for everyone. It's about sharing knowledge. So um, maybe less on the technology side, but certainly um, in terms of sharing of information and sharing of drafting, uh, you do get a bit. Right, so I think in the real haulage sector that I'm in, I think there are quite a few challenges to adopt open source. I think one of them, first of all, is the traditional way of working. Um, so this is the uh, industry have a very fragmented presence of both, you know, ship and haulage as we call them. A lot of them actually work in silos and um, trying to sharing data or sharing, you know, their network probably is going to be very challenging task for any one of us. Um, and another barrier that I can see from, you know, what I, I, I have experienced so far is the way of working within the organization is very traditional way of working. A lot of them are still working on phones, making phone calls and, you know, just, uh, you know, some, some of them still even even still use fax. So um, <laughs> so trying to actually leverage, trying to enhance their understanding of technology and basically you know, make them digitized and make them shareable even, that is going to be a, what, one of the challenges that we are going to that we're going to face. So I would say that you know different sectors and industries have their uh, unique challenge. Some of them are early adopter of digitization. Some of them are not so early. Um, so we probably need to look into this problem with different lens. That you know which stage are you in, and how could we actually learn from other sectors to jumpstart um, so that we, we we don't get into the rabbit holes that other people have experienced already. Yeah. I think that's a really great point around the like the way that people are operating and actually if you think about open sources well let's stick a different license on something that we do let's like use a different piece of paper then it's like, oh well sure what we should adopt open source but it's not that it's actually changing the way that people interact with each other the way that kind of things develop and that's why it's hard um, it's not kind of like, oh, we'll just use some different legal wording. It's we want to change the way that we interact. Um, we want to change culture. And so that's that's a big challenge. We have two questions. So I'm going to pass the mic here and then. Hi, actually, it's more of a comment, but um, in relation to the discussion around uh, standards, I think you mentioned standards, but generally, so I'm in the broadcast space. So I'm looking at AI in, you know, broadcast space and to, to get a standard to be accepted or for that, sorry, for there to be adoption, it takes about nine years. And we've had these conversations with public service broadcasters. So from the perspective of a small comp as a small company owner, I just, I mean, we would, we may have sold the business by then, you know, it's, we wouldn't wait that long, you know, to, to adopt for a standard to be adopted because that's just not, you know, it's not good for business for us to be looking. Uh, I mean, of course, we can have these conversations. So I'm just wondering. So this is to to your point earlier. Like, what 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 do we need to do legally to get things moving faster? Because you know, it's that's too long. Yeah, absolutely. I think I share the same feeling because you know. But let's not forget that. Forget we are not boiling the ocean in one go. So. Um, adopting standard take long time. This is long term strategy. I think every organization like ours should be embracing them into the you know our long term vision. But I think there will always be short term and medium term gains and you know incentives for the company to actually achieve. So those are ambitious but achievable goals. So not every standard that that we want to adopt, but maybe some starting point, break them into chunks that is chewable in you know, maybe months or even just one year, two year that people feel that is reachable. So that when people see the positive gains, then that reinforce their confidence that we're going to achieve in the long term, even if it is nine, 10 years, like you just mentioned, as long as we can see their achievement, their progress being made, 
I think this is something that, you know, we can always work on this long term plan. Yeah, so funnily enough, I used to did did some work in the broadcast sector a few years ago when um, when Freeview Play, the the, the backward facing EPG was launched. I was involved in rolling out the um, the contracts for the, the the back office metadata systems. Um, and something I learned through that, yeah, sure. So something I learned, I learned through that process is that, I mean, that industry is heavily reliant on standards in terms of the. Um, that the, the technology and the testing systems, uh, you know, if, if you want to bring a new television to market, you know, bearing in mind that you've got to have the cross compatibility with all of the other systems, the broadcast systems that are involved, um, you need, you know, in, integration throughout the, the entire vertical to make sure that um, everything operates correctly. And some of the challenges when you're trying to put apps on smart TVs and all the things that you have to comply with in order to do that. Um, but what I did find is that the the, the public service broadcasters were were quite um, certainly when I spoke to them were quite keen to develop standards and raise raise the bar for the entire industry um, in terms of the development of standards. I guess the challenge is, you know, how do you progress that if you've got limited resources? Um, I think openness is probably a way to do that because fundamentally you need this standard to be adopted universally in order for it to be. Um, viable right everyone needs to work with it so i think you know forming a community around it forming a project getting the technical people it depends on the nature of the standard but you know get get the get the people who are going to be writing that standard get the expertise together and start building that community and building enthusiasm for doing it and then hopefully you know as that develops you can get the the, the psbs involved and, and and get the rest of the market obviously not just the, the the broadcasters but the technology providers um you know the programming providers you know the the, the whole the whole segment and and see about creating a community that's probably the way i'd i'd think about it Thanks. Uh, thanks for the, the talk this morning, really um, useful. Um, I guess the, a quick version of my question is, should the UK have an equivalent of the EU's FOSA or the US's SOSA or the German Sovereign Fund? And what role should it play in the UK? Um, for those people who might need a little bit more background on that one, the diagram you're going to show basically from the XACD comic says that we rely on software that's developed by the lonely code from Nebraska. And all of these acts really are there to say we should invest and support that, especially as things like AI is not just a great thing for innovation, but it's also proving a security threat across GitHub currently in Python libraries. So what can we do as, a, as the what should we do in the UK to help protect our open infrastructure? I guess I'll I'll start and then and see if anyone else has any views. So um, Open UK did a um, they they have a survey which gets released in two or three parts um, each year, and one of the findings out of that was that actually the UK has one of the highest per capita uh, number of developers um, who are working in particularly in open source. Uh, and they did that they used a um, number of GitHub accounts as a proxy for, for for that to try and work out okay how many developers are working in the UK and then compare that to the the population to get the the, the per capita number. Um, so the talent is there, the skills are there. The question is how do you then bring that to the fore and, and leverage that and fundamentally financing uh, and, and being able to reward those developers for their work is one of the fundamental issues I think that we're facing. And what you will see is that even where a business starts in the UK, we're very good at startups. We're very good at, at, at taking an idea and turning it into a business and, and developing products, but then very rapidly, they get bought out by US companies and, and, and the, the, you know, the headquarters gets moved out to the, the US. It's that, it's that stage where businesses start to get interesting that actually we're quite short of um, financing op options. Um, and I think that's where we need to think about, you know, what can we do to drive money into the, uh, into the ecosystem at that point, just as, just as companies start to get interesting to, you know, the, um, the sort of VCs and, and large scale investors. Especially as they might not get bought out because it might be such a UK centric thing they're doing. So I, I, I just want to um, add, there was a EU policy forum, open source policy forum recently, where 
um, a lot of European Union, European Commission, UNESCO, and you know, big government were in there talking about the implication of Cyber Resilience Act and AI Act, EU AI Act, uh, where they are being forced to commit to invest in open source. And I do agree that there is lack of those kind of conversation right now in the UK. We, we hear a lot about AI, but less about the importance of open source. We do hear about transparency and responsible, and we'll hear about responsible AI in, in the second panel. Um, but we don't really hear about investments such as done by sovereign tech fund in Germany, for instance. And I would jump into whatever bandwagon you're going to put together to, <laughs> to run this because we do need investment in this area. Um, I'm going to close the session. We, yeah, OK. We are running a little bit over. Uh, so OK. Sorry. How can we better track the utilization and therefore the impact of open science in the sector? Is that a one minute to answer question? How do we drive impact of open science in these sectors? Um, wait till this afternoon uh, is part of the answer. So one of the case studies that we are talking about is around um, the open source uh, energy UK kind of the catalog of open energy projects um, and that it, part of the goal of that is to help people understand well where what are people working on and where is where are things being used um so i think there is a role for um for kind of tools and monitoring in that space um and then for kind of thinking about well who cares about that um in government in policy like who should be kind of uh tracking this um, and kind of getting them to to fund some activities in that space that's my short answer yeah, we'll have case studies and we'll hear more. And of course, we have more panel coming up. Please save your questions uh, for that. We want to first thanks, thank our panelists. It's been fantastic listening to you. And thank you for spending time with us this morning. And ho hopefully you stay with us the whole day. And please grab them for a chat. Thanks so much. We're now moving for a break. Sorry for running a bit over. Please take 10 minutes, uh, grab some drinks, take a break, and chat with each other. <laughs> <laughs> okay um we're gonna do a very quick report out and this time i'd like to start with the online folks um we have we have more chances for discussion I, I i hate to be the person who breaks people from talking um so i would actually go back to the main room first and uh, if it's okay we can start the recording of this part oh good that's all um yeah folks in uh, online who were in breakout room uh, did, would you like to share some of the highlights from your room with rest of the folks and if so please Unmute yourself or raise your hand. Okay, I'm gonna probably. Okay, thanks, Amanda. Fine, then we come to this room, which just could not stop talking. Uh, would, <laughs> would you like to share some of the highlights from your uh, discussion? Sorry? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'll come back to you. Patricia, please unmute yourself and uh, do share. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Or oh, good afternoon now. Um, okay. Yeah. Just, just be... a few seconds, Patricia. We're getting your volume up here. Okay. Now, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, there were only two of us in the breakout room, and um, uh, you know it was great. That was I was with Jeff uh, from 
Zest Consult. And my name is Patricia Obituku, CEO, Best Produce International UK Limited. We deal with food and agriculture. So in discussion, we just looked at the different areas and especially to do with, um, you know, the entry access for small businesses. You know, most of the time when there is new uh, software or new things coming on, where it's pitch, a lot of people are left behind. So dealing with um, small businesses from emerging markets, in market access or quality standard, I was looking at how will this uh, AI benefit them and also for charities. So we are discussing about possible training for um, you know, small businesses that we give them step-by-step -step approach. So we're looking how to collaborate in that and then to also look at supporting uh, charities in UK that needs to understand the risk assessment in, in managing AI and how to develop their own risk management. So that's the highlights for us. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, then I go back to this room. Uh, was there was there a report out person selected? I'm gonna I'm gonna check if non previously non speakers want to say something. Okay, <laughs> you've been you've been elected. <laughs> Why am I being given this? Um, um, I think our discussion, um, um, I would like to co-nominate uh, Sam uh, to, to speak. I think our, our conversation, um, we became aware that we were talking about general software development and, and the general use of open source and our utter dependency on open source, whether we know it or not. Um, and the use of it with AI or data science was an additional twist. Uh, there were comments that, um, made about um, uh, regression testing, for example, as a, as a concept that needed to be, um, uh, people needed to be aware of. Uh, James talked a lot about uh, the, um, the health sector where there can be massive dependencies on libraries that are no longer supported uh, and need some effort. And I think Sam mentioned a tool that could be used to uh, check out um, what your actual dependencies are, whether you know them or not, which is all very useful. There was a model of, of uh, becoming involved in open source development and with others that was co uh, compared to pro bono work and being um, able to afford to get to become engaged in, in that, for example. Um, and also a claim that, that IP as a concept is going to disappear. And therefore maybe we didn't work, need to, the implication is that we didn't need to worry about that quite so much as we might've done in the past. I think I've yeah, done enough. Good, <laughs> James, do you want to add something? No, James, Sam? Story about that. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, so um, the story, this is from the medical device technology uh, sector. There's, um, an eye implant, a visual implant. I think it's by a company called Apollo. And the company developed it many years, over many years, you know, developed using software as a medical device, you know, regulated approach, et cetera. Had the physical hardware, lots of people had them installed, um, you know, had these sort of implants, able to give them some degree of visual um, input. Uh, unfortunately, the company went bust, uh, but because the technology had been de developed around open source uh, technologies, um, it was possible for the people who have these implants to essentially take control and start hacking their eyes and saying, well, because essentially the devices started to malfunction, they were no longer working as expected. So they formed a community around their, their uh, devices that allowed them to continue to maintain and operate them. So that's the, the story. So uh, I may not have got all the details right there, but hopefully that's uh, interesting. Thank you. Um, we had two more rooms, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Do you see them? 
Hi, thank you for that. Um, Hi, Kate. Nick Chandler. We, we were in a, a group of three. Um, there was myself, Manzo and Sergei, uh, and we went into quite a lot of detail on the questions. Um, but just as a really quick um, background, we were looking at how do we find the applicable solutions for our area? Uh, how do we audit the open source code for uh, accountability? How do we check the history and version control of the source? And how does that integrate with appropriate software updates and applications? What's the baseline of the data that you may be using for your AI, on high, for your AI and how can you synthesize those requirements? Uh, and what steps do you need in order to remain compliant within that? Um, a little bit further, we looked into how the regulations will be developed, enforced and integrated to an effective standard. Um, discussed very briefly the British Standards Institute standards that are coming out on AI. What security protocols could be secured against potentially adversarial AI uh, that could impact your product and your capability? Um, but then culturally, how do you prevent restrictions from primes uh, that are developed to block access to AI and um, reduce creativity and innovation by buying up the, the smaller companies who are developing these capabilities? And that leads on to how the Monopolies Commission may monitor restrictions on creativity, innovation and, and when groups are getting too large, as works in a standard practice function. We looked at the concerns of licensing, the implication by different use case business models, et cetera, and how are those benefits assessed. Um, if you've got AI specific IP and regulation, looking at open source versus open weights, um, we had the misconception considerations of how we can't use AI directly, potentially as it is with um, associated funding lines, making sure that they're open to all. Um, but finally having a product that is secure by design that you can utilize transparently transparently whilst assuring uh, an appropriate methodology with an open training process that's subject to audit. That is that is very comprehensive. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, so 60 seconds round up from the other rooms, if you would like, no pressure, of course. Um, did you have a report? Okay, yeah. And one of the members from our group, maybe. Uh, going to details. So uh, the main discussion points were license, licensing and choosing the right license uh, and their impact on the business models. Uh, we talk about it, they are all sector dependent and infringement of IP rights, of course, and assessing the impact of open source is also a challenge when you think about uh, their short term and long term impact uh, and also AI specific, uh, we discuss about how we should release open source models, like we can release it as completely open source or like we can release open weights. And uh, we generally cannot use AI as it is, so we need to invest a lot on uh, particular capabilities. And also assuring the data uh, is coming from good source and possible impacts are like, it can be garbage in, garbage out, or like it can cause some bias. And also we talk about transparency needs and defining responsibility uh, is also requires some sector specific analysis. Yeah. And thank you so much. Uh, we will have lunch where you can continue having this discussion. But now I'm gonna bring up on stage, Amanda, we had, uh, we had accidentally or intentionally put some buffer time and Amanda was uh, invited to join a second panel and then we messed up and you know, that's how I messed up. I messed up. Yes, I did. <laughs> no. Um, so I'm really glad that we have this chance to sit down and talk to you. Um, so I know Amanda from her work in Open UK. If you do not know Open UK, you'll have a chance to hear about that now. She has enormous experience uh, in open source and legal implication, but one of the areas where she is championing open source is working with government and small companies, being a voice of small companies in the parliament. So thanks, Amanda, for letting me correct my mess up. And please, can you uh, start by telling a bit uh, about you, uh, Open UK, and how all the conversation that we are having here today is relevant to that. Thank you very much for having me along. And I'm really sorry, I should have been on the 1020 panel. Um, I have ADHD, and if it's not on my calendar, I don't do it. So uh, it wasn't in my calendar, so I didn't do it. Um, so I think it's probably my fault. But I'm quite happy to talk to you about anything I know about today. And 
my background is that I'm the CEO of Open UK and we are an industry organization with a difference. So we're four years old and instead of being an industry organization that brings together companies, we bring together people. And we've realized that that instinct four years ago actually is for a very good reason which is when you look at many of the people who are involved in open technology, and we'll get on to what open technology is in a moment, um, they work for international companies from the UK. So if we only focused on the UK companies, like most of the other open source organizations in geographic areas, we would end up with a few companies who were engaged with us. Whereas I think particularly in the UK, because of the English speaking nature of the country, we, we end up with a lot of people working, particularly in the US or in what I would call the international tech sector. And we often describe those people and the businesses that are part of it as the submarine under the digital economy, because we actually contribute a huge amount economically to the UK and to the digital tech sector or the tech sector. But we, um, we're often not seen and we're not seen because we're more likely to work with people in other countries than our neighbors. We don't tend to be at a lot of events in the UK. We're all over the world meeting all the people we collaborate globally with. And uh, many of us work from home. So we just don't interact with that many people. So what we've discovered is there's a huge workforce in the UK who already do that. And we hope that we can build more of that in the UK because it's something we're really good at. And I think it really lends itself to the innovative nature of people in the UK. So a long way of explaining that we focus on people and we rely on the companies to come behind the people. We then don't focus on open source software alone. We focus on open tech. And what that means, we've talked about three pillars, traditionally software, hardware, data. And those are really what we focus on. And my board, my leadership team, we believe that that covers everything. But what we've seen with AI is that's not always clear to people. So we now talk a bit about open standards and open AI. So anything that's open, we look at and we try to bring into the conversation. And our goal is UK leadership and global collaboration in open technology. So we are trying to build out what we think is already a center of excellence in the UK, gain recognition for that, gain more government funding for it, make it easier for SMEs in that space to get funded, for projects to grow here in the UK. So there's all sorts of different pieces in that jigsaw that we're trying to pull together. Um, my personal background is that I was a lawyer for 25 years and most of those were spent in companies. I stopped doing that five years ago. Um, in 2008, almost 16 years ago, I guess, I joined a company called Canonical that I'm sure some of you will know, um, based out of London. And I think I was employee 185. Uh, I was the general counsel, so I managed the legal requirements globally. And I was there five years, which if any of you have worked in that kind of startup is like, you know, 30 or 40 years in a real company. Um, and it was a strange experience because I worked all over the world and I think I did two deals in five years in Europe, not just the UK, but in Europe, one uh, with a company based out of Luxembourg and repeated small deals with one big UK company because the UK just wasn't engaging. And what we had were gatekeepers. We had legal, we had procurement, we had finance that stopped uh, open source being adopted in their companies. In the last 10 years, particularly the last three to five, we've seen a shift. And there's a whole bunch of reasons. The ones that I always pick out are digitalization, which has changed the role of engineers. So engineers are able to have more say in what's going on. But I think the, the, the repos, now I'm from Canonical, so I was using Launchpad, but whatever you're using, GitHub, GitLab, whatever it is, the accessibility of code and the ability to just bring code into your organization, I think is the key thing that has shifted in the last few years. And from a, you know, a risk perspective, there is reason to tell you about all of this. From a risk perspective, what that's done is move from your gatekeepers because you don't need money. You can just bring it in. So you don't go through finance approval. You don't go through procurement. You don't go through legal. Instead, what you should be looking at for your risk profile is policy, your internal policies and processes. And when we talk about policy back in 2012, I was on a cabinet office advisory group and the UK, I think it was 2011-12, had the first open source first policy in its public sector. Except that policy is still the policy we have today. And what we don't really have are the processes behind it. 
So if you look around companies, the policies that I'm talking about that you need to manage risk are often not there, or if they are there, they, they aren't backed by processes. And if you don't have that, your engineers are going to do what they want, and it needs to be done the right way. In the public sector, we have an open source first policy, but actually it's not always honored, it doesn't have teeth, and even if it is honored, government uses open source generally to avoid lock-in if they're bringing code in, and if they're creating code, they do it to create code that will be recycled and reused. So from that perspective, you don't really achieve that if you don't have a broader picture beyond just saying that you put it on GitHub with an open source license. Because what you do is you create a wild west of code that nobody's ever going to use. So as you sort of move forward with Open UK and the, the lobbying and the policy work that we do, and you look at AI, what it does is sort of match our remit. And our remit is to look at all the different aspects of openness. So open data, open source software. You've probably noticed that there's a lot of disagreement. Some of it is very informed and some of it's very ill-informed around what open AI is, what open source AI is, what open source is in AI. And we're all sort of finding our way at this stage, I think. But if you go back to what I'm talking about in terms of open source software, what you see is usage that isn't matched by understanding usage that isn't matched by policy and processes. And there's a sort of disconnect where we're catching up and the world is still looking at a proprietary way of dealing with things, although we're in an open world. And when you look at, Synopsys does a report every year, they've just done it, I've not read it 